One year ago, a peaceful protest took place across Canada. It was the fascist suppression of that demonstration which inspired this video. Because it turns out, such authoritarianism could happen here, in the United States of America, the so-called land of the free. This is a video about U.S. Code Title 47, Subsection 606, The War Powers of the President. But first... The Freedom Convoy began in response to a new national health measure announced by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Commercial truck drivers were now required to be vaccinated against COVID-19 to enter the country, or face a 14-day quarantine period upon arrival. A lot of trade goes by road between Canada and the United States. It's impossible to work in the shipping industry if every time you cross the border, you couldn't move for two weeks. Truckers didn't like being told to get the vaccination or else. So they got in their heavy vehicles and started driving. Their destination? Ottawa, the capital. They came from all over Canada. They started arriving on January 27th, 2022. Once they got there, their method of protesting was quite creative. It consisted of hopping on the street. Imagine that outside your window, night and day, for three weeks. Aside from being aggravating, the protest was violence-free. For the most part, the worst thing I found was on January 29th, some protesters entered the Shepherds of Good Hope soup kitchen and demanded meals. In the end, they physically assaulted a homeless man and hurled racial epithets at a black security guard. Not a great moment. There are also these guys. Not a great look. To be clear, this does seem to be the worst of it. The point was to be heard, not hurt people. This was not a Nazi rally, more like a block party. <laughs> Looks like a blast. By this time, the protest was more of an anti-Justin Trudeau affair than strictly about vaccine mandates. I think the Freedom Convoy will be remembered as a highlight of a broader conservative countercultural movement. It's not one that I fully embrace, but you know, I get where they're coming from. The government wasn't listening to them, and they had enough. Then the stakes got higher. On February 7th, a group of protesters began to block the Ambassador Bridge. The Ambassador Bridge is a vital thoroughfare between the United States and Canada, connecting the border cities of Detroit and Windsor. This corridor is vital to international trade, with $360 million going through every day. 25% of all trade between Canada and the US. That's by value, not tonnage. And not just here, other border crossings as well. It's an effective protest. They now have the attention of the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. They are now demanding the removal of all COVID health mandates, not just those relating to vaccines. If you don't get what you don't ask for, Trudeau really had three options here. One, he could just wait it out. But at this point, people are pretty upset. <laughs> Option two, he could negotiate with the convoy's organizers. Perhaps he could offer or appeal the initial vaccination mandates. It couldn't hurt. Here was Justin Trudeau's response to that. I have also chosen to not go anywhere near protests that have expressed hateful rhetoric violence towards fellow citizens, uh, and a disrespect, uh, not just of science, but of uh, the frontline health workers and, quite frankly, the 90% of truckers who have been doing the right thing to keep Canadians safe, to put food on our tables. Did you catch that? 90% of Canada's 325,000 truckers were already vaccinated. For perspective, the overall Canadian population vaccination rate for five years and up is 87 percent. You do the math. But no, someone had a swastika, so now Trudeau won't talk to them. Option three. He could crush the protest by force. 
But this is a liberal democracy. That would never happen. The federal government has invoked the Emergencies Act to supplement provincial and territorial capacity to address the blockades and occupations. These tools include strengthening their ability to impose fines or imprisonment. These blockades are illegal, and if you're still participating, the time to go home is now. The Emergencies Act grants the Canadian federal government new powers. Trudeau was now able to declare the protests illegal, then charge and arrest people for not leaving. But he wasn't done yet. The law states the Prime Minister has the power of A. The regulation or prohibition of 1. Any public assembly that may reasonably be expected to lead to a breach of the peace. This is the justification that Justin Trudeau used to crush the demonstration. But he had another trick up his high society sleeve. The use of specified property. Specified property can mean a lot of things, like semi-trucks or money. You sure I'm going with this? The Canadian government had frozen people's personal bank accounts. 210 accounts for eight days. The protest was all wrapped up by February 23rd, 2022. Police arrested 191 people, charging 107. I remember when I was hearing all about this for the first time. My initial thought was, my god, were those trucks all idling the entire time? It was below freezing in Ottawa for all but five days, so yeah, I think they were. My second thought was, boy, I'm sure glad I'm an American. I have rights. My government would never crush a protest like that. But then, I remember my spiritual father, George Carlin. Folks, I hate to spoil your fun, but there's no such thing as rights, okay? They're imaginary. We made them up. Boy, was he right. In the wake of the infamous Pearl Harbor attack, President Franklin Roosevelt signed the War Powers of the President into law. This is the American equivalent of the Canadian Emergencies Act. It doesn't do exactly the same thing. It's far more nefarious. Allow me to introduce to you the war powers of the president. But first, some important context. In the vast compendium of U.S. laws, this one is found in Title 47 Telecommunications. That's because, when this was originally written, it was all about radio. At the dawn of World War II, radio was the most advanced form of mass communication. Cutting edge stuff. And because this is a communications law, it falls under the purview of the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC. This commission is referenced several times throughout the documents as a group the president must work with in order to enact his new powers. So these powers can be invoked for a national emergency. Remember, the only requirement here is that the president of the United States deems it necessary for national security. With that out of the way, allow me to summarize these first parts. Subsection A allows the president to mandate his communications get priority in a crisis. Subsection B allows him to use the military to prevent people from interfering with essential communications. Subsection C is where it gets interesting. President of the United States may cause the closing of any station for radio communication or any device capable of emitting electromagnetic radiation between 10 kilocycles and 100,000 megacycles, which is suitable for use as a navigational aid beyond five miles. There it is, folks. That sentence right there is the main reason why this act is so dangerous. Let's take a look at the electromagnetic spectrum. Frequency is measured in cycles per second, or hertz. The low end of the law's scope is 10 kilohertz. The high end is 100,000 megahertz. This is a massive range. That's 10 to the third hertz to 10 to the 11 hertz. Conventional radio falls here. Technologically speaking, we've made a lot of progress since 1942. We now have many devices which transmit electromagnetic radiation. Just in that range, here are GPS, mobile phones, and Wi-Fi routers. Thankfully, computers fall below this range. 
Okay, so these devices, do you think they can be used as navigational aids? If the answer is yes, the government can shut them off in a crisis. But I'm not done yet, there's also this line. The president may authorize the use or control of any such station or device and or its apparatus and equipment by any department of the government. Your stuff can be co-opted by the government. Citizen. Hmm? Hand over your smartphone. Uncle Sam needs it. You'll get your compensation check in the mail. What? You're resisting? Sounds like you want 20 years in prison. Thank you. Hand over your car keys, too. It has a built-in GPS, doesn't it? Thanks. Move along, citizen. I think that's only a slight exaggeration. Anyway, there's more to this document. Subsection D. The President may cause the closing of any facility or station for wire communication and the removal therefrom of its apparatus and equipment. What is the definition of wire communications? We can find out by referring to Title 47, Subsection 153, the Communications Act of 1934. Incidentally, this is also the law that founded the Federal Communications Commission. Subsection A. Wire communication, or communication by wire, means the transmission of writing, signs, signals, pictures, and sounds of all kinds by aid of wire, cable, pop quiz. What do we use fiber optic cables for? The internet. And wouldn't be hard to shut off either. All US internet runs through a network of internet exchange points, physical locations. Oh, and look, so many wires. I suppose if these were shut off, you could try and connect to a foreign ISP. Let me just look up how to do it and, oh, there's no internet. What are you gonna do? go back in time and buy a Starlink console, and of course, the government will be able to use the internet just fine. There are two things that make this law have a greater scope than the Canadian Emergencies Act. For one, it could happen to anyone. There is no distinction drawn between those participating in a protest and anybody else. So conceivably, everyone could be affected. Two, I couldn't find a time limit on this thing. The Canadian Emergencies Act has a provision that the powers must end after 30 days unless it's allowed to be continued by the House and the Senate. Not in America. I could find no hard limit on the duration of the national emergency itself. So, conceivably, it could last for eternity. I'm sure Congress or the courts could do something to stop this, but I'd be a lot happier if there was something restricting this in the law itself, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? The big question is, what has stopped a president from using this law in the past? Precedent. Precedent stops the president. Nothing else. If you think this is messed up, you should call your congressional representative. What else can you do? Realistically, this law is going to be invoked before anyone even knows it exists. Not you, though, you lucky dog. If you want more on the Freedom Convoy, you should check out Tanner O'Crane on YouTube at Tire Roaster's Garage. It's some of the best on-the-ground journalism of the event you're going to find. It's also where I found the majority of the awesome B-Reel I used in this video. That's it. Move along, citizen. It's over. I love you. Some of you are probably thinking 100,000 megahertz sounded a bit unusual. And you'd be right. That quantity is better expressed as 100 gigahertz. But giga wasn't even a thing back then. It was created in 1947 by the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry to describe a quantity that had nine zeros. Think about that. When the law was written, the terminology was not yet created that could optimally express the numbers it was talking about. Someone should probably fix that in the law. We wouldn't want people getting confused now, would we? See ya.